So they took Brian away that night. They, they came in, they tried to search. Well, they did, they searched our flat, but we had gotten rid of everything. Yeah. We got, we had gotten rid of everything that could have pointed to anybody else. Mm. And they took him away and I said, where are you taking him and when will he be back? Yeah. Uh, and their answer was, well, just the police station around the corner, so-and-so, and he'll be back tomorrow morning. And I thought, no, he won't. <laughs> Um, and I heard nothing for, I think it was 48 hours. And then I got a call again in the middle of the night and uh, it was Brian on the phone. I'm like, well, well, where are you? What's going on? And he said, you know, those those things that I took to those people's house, They, if you will get those books, then they say that they will let me go. Hi guys, Matt here from Frontiers, welcome back. Really good to have you again on Raw Mission, where you can hear encouraging and challenging stories of Jesus followers taking the good news to the ends of the earth. From the miraculous to the mundane, from the heartbreaking to the awe-inspiring, we'll be bringing you the whole spectrum of real-life stories, from ordinary broken workers who are persevering heroically in some of the tough places to see the name of the Lord Jesus exalted and Muslims come to faith in Him. And today I have a very special gift for you. You're going to meet Brian and Jalita. And as they share their story, you'll be traveling back several years with them to when they lived in Cairo, Egypt. And they'll be recounting a time when Brian was arrested and imprisoned with several of his friends for almost three months. And that's not all. Jalita will be sharing very personally and honestly about a tragic loss that their family had to endure out there. It's going to be an amazing episode, so sit tight and enjoy this one. Well, hi, guys. Uh, Brian and Jalita, so good to be with you this morning. Great to be with you, Matt. Hi there. Yeah, now I'm really excited to hear the stories you've got to share. Um, there are going to be some powerful moments, I know, in this podcast. But just going back a little bit, um, Brian, give us a quick summary of how you ended up in the Middle East. So at the end, of, the end of university in the States, God really started giving me a heart for the nations and a calling. I really sensed that. So I pursued that right away out of university. I did a short term in the Philippines for a summer and then one year in East Africa and came back from those. Yeah, they just kind of cemented things for me and knew I was going to be calling into missions. So I wanted to kind of the next step, Lord, what is it? And my director from that time in East Africa said, you really need to go out to Pasadena to the U.S. Center for World Mission mm. for some more training and take this course, Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. Yeah. And that that was so helpful for expanding my understanding of the unreached hidden mm. nations, the peoples that need to be reached. Brilliant. And and what was your, before you started sensing this call from God, however that looked like um, towards global mission, what were you thinking your life would, where would it be going? I thought my life would be, I thought I'd be teaching history, coaching American football within a few years, getting my master's degree and being a, a school administrator, high school principal. Oh, um, okay. So you but, had quite a few dreams and I suppose, it, was it hard letting some of those go? It wasn't, it wasn't that hard at the time because God worked in my life so clearly. Hmm. I had doubts though through the years then, you know, kind of times where, well, what would life have been like if I had continued that track? But the Lord gave me back some of it, just mm -hmm. interestingly enough. We've been here in England 22 years. And lo and behold, I was able to volunteer coaching American football at the university in town here. So <laughs> that's it's been a blast. Yeah, not many, not many people would imagine that we even yeah, have any American that's football right. in England. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so Jalita, you're you're from Texas originally. Yes, sir. I mm. showed up am small town. How, how, and how did you meet uh, how did you meet Brian then? Well, we met in Pasadena, California. Um, I had coming out of university uh, with a journalism degree, um, I realized I had a choice in front of me. God had made it clear to me during my university years that um, that verse, to whom much is given, much is required. Mm. Uh, I had thought had to do with money, but and we didn't have all that much, yeah. but God made it clear to me, he opened my eyes to all that I had 
received from him um, growing up in a church, growing up with a loving family, mm. uh, those two rock solid foundations of my life. Mm. And um, then I encountered people who were talking about peoples and places in the world where no one was inviting people to follow Jesus the way I had been invited to follow Jesus as a child. Yeah. And um, yeah, then I ran across a brochure from Frontiers. It was maybe one of the very first yeah. that was ever printed. And it said in big type, missionaries to Muslims are one in a million, mm. literally. And wow. the injustice of that gripped my heart. Mm -hmm. I had so much opportunity to know who Jesus was from my childhood. And to think about that there were other people who didn't even have that opportunity at all didn't seem right. It didn't seem fair. Mm. Oh, and, such a powerful uh, word. Yeah, the greatest yeah. injustice I sometimes... Yeah think about it because you know young people today they love talking about justice and inequality and you know the the poor distribution of wealth and you mentioned that you know mm. the, people often think this is the major thing in life if we're wealthy we'll be fine if we're educated we'll be fine but actually we know there's there, there's a greater richness isn't there there's a greater wealth yeah. out there that, that jesus yes. has offered and that's worth going to the ends of the earth for and living for jesus for that yeah it doesn't matter how comfortable wealthy we get in this life and what are we going to provide for our kids stability security and wealth and education is that that it no i think if we know jesus we know there's so much more and, and well can't we offer that you know to those who don't know him as well yeah, yeah. we don't even have a chance to know him yeah exactly <laughs> and and that's yeah. definitely what what breaks our hearts doesn't it at frontiers and we believe breaks god's heart that third of the world you know, that still doesn't know Jesus. And and for us particularly, it's those 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide, a quarter of the world's population that hardly any of them, you know, know a true follower of Jesus at all. Still today, you said one in a million, I think, for um, missionaries yeah. to Muslims in those days. I mean, it's not that much greater now, is it? I think I, no. I, think I read it's one in every 400,000 um, missionaries to Muslims these days. So, yeah, there's a lot to be done still. So how did that um, carry on then for your journey? You guys met in Pasadena. You already had a heart for Global Mission at that point. What, what happened next? Yeah, so then we found each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we got married in Pasadena. And we, we had a few years left there in Pasadena after we got married. Um, we were working with an organization called Zwaymer Institute of Muslim Studies. Mm -hmm. And in that, I was helping people reach out to Muslims living in Southern California. So mm -hmm. we had a team focusing on Arabs living in Southern California and Iranians and so yeah. on. So um, that was an important ministry. Um, mm -hmm. But then we really sensed the Lord was calling us to go overseas somewhere. So just through that process and working with our sending church there in Pasadena, Mm. Our, the church we joined there in Pasadena became our sending church. Okay. And um, we ended up joining Frontiers because we worked so closely with Frontiers through Zwaymer. Mm. Uh, we were located in the same building as Frontiers. We knew Frontiers very well. We did a lot of the training for Frontiers. And it was just a natural transition for us, I think, to go with Frontiers. Yeah. And we just appreciated the focus that Frontiers had. Yeah, I mean, those those were the early days, I suppose, of Frontiers. Yeah, it was um, the very early days. Yeah. So there were a lot of radicals, a lot of you know young guys just saying, Lord, open the door in the toughest places for us and, you know, we'll try yeah. and go. So, so yes, where did you guys end up? So we went to Egypt. We went to Cairo in August of 1990. Okay. We joined an existing team, mm -hmm. uh, but with the intention of eventually starting our own team there. Yeah. So that was the kind of track we thought we'd be on. Okay. And yeah. we, we actually, <clears throat> and this is unusual, we joined the team that my parents were on. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And so this is a little shout out for people who are, well, the age that we are now. <laughs> yes. Um, my parents earlier in life had um, really come alive to the Lord and began to understand the same things I 
was understanding in my university years mm. um, that there were people out there who still didn't even have any opportunity to know Jesus. And they said, well, when we retire, we want to do something about that. Brilliant. Um, and then the Lord brought on their retirement earlier in their lives than they expected. My dad was actually in a massive car accident. And although eventually he was fully healed from it, it was a long journey and he took our early retirement. And then my mom also took early retirement hmm. and they said, okay, Lord, what do you want to do with us? Wow. And they came to visit us before we were married. They came to visit us out in California and um, they were asking that question hmm. and uh, God ended up directing them really clearly. And they joined Frontiers and went to Cairo to provide hospitality. Their job mm -hmm. was to support the team there. It was a very busy place in those years mm -hmm. with lots of people coming through and just wanting to visit and check, mm -hmm. check things out. And um, so they ran a hospitality house. Wow, that's and brilliant. Yeah. So just a shout out to anybody who might be listening to this. Yes. If you're in your 50s, 60s, mm. even beyond, yep. it doesn't mean it's too late. God it's still late. may have yes. plans for you. I love that. Thank I you. Think, what, a, what a great word. Yeah, Brian. I think we would have joined that team anyway. I think we would have. Um, <laughs> the way the Lord was directing us. Yeah. But it was just such a, a huge bonus to actually serve mm. with Julia's parents. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we, I remember we sent just a few years ago, we sent a couple, yeah, similar kind of age to Pakistan. Um, and yeah, it's a wonderful time of life, isn't it? When your kids are off at university, suddenly you've got this freedom from raising kids and all the energy and intensity. Yeah. Some people, right. some people go out with young kids. Some people go out before they've had kids or before they get married or they may never get married and that's amazing when when they're young you've got so much opportunity to dive into language but there's a huge role for older folks um pastoring and caring for people on the team or serving in hospitality like you said i love exactly. that that's a really good word and they ended up being mm. they they ended up coming alongside new believers mm. who were risking losing their families yes um um yeah they became mother and father for a number of new believers really yeah. oh, that's amazing yeah. so, so it was, yeah it was a powerful ministry even though they didn't know themselves they didn't focus on reaching out mm -hmm. to muslims around them really but just because they had the love of christ they were able to really mm -hmm. minister to these yeah new believers Brilliant. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about team, isn't it? Everyone plays a different role. Some are, That's right. yeah. you know, crazy young evangelists out there and others are just maybe running an NGO or a business and others can do hospitality and pastoral care, strengthen the team, care for the yeah. team members. Yeah. Hmm. So what was your, your job out there? Did you both go out to work in Cairo? How did that look? And did you have young kids at all by this stage or was this pre-kids? So this was, we didn't have children when we went to the field. We had wanted to have children. Um, we were... We were struggling with infertility. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, very and, common. Yeah. A lot of people plan their, oh, yes, we'll go to the field when, the, you know, when we have this child and what, it doesn't right. work. Yeah. Like that, does it? It so just, we kind of work, we work through that. Do we wait until we have children to leave? And we just mm. felt, no, let's trust the Lord with yeah. this area. I think we're being, we think we're being called mm -hmm. to go. So let's go and we'll see what the Lord does. Mm. And miraculously, <laughs> the Lord within a, within a month or two mm. gave us a, a living situation where our landlady who became very good friends with us, especially with Julita had gone through some of the same infertility issues and mm. connected us with one of the best infertility specialists in the country. No way. That's and that cool. led to our son being born there. Wow. That's a cool story. At the same time, there was, um, there was loss in that process. We mm. conceived twins and I carried them to full term. Yeah. And um, our son had a twin sister mm. who we buried because she was still born. I'm so sorry. Um, so early in our time there, we had mm. some great joy and some deep grief. Yeah. All at the same time. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm so sorry, yeah. guys. Yeah, my some of my family have been through that, and it's just 
I mean, there's no greater trauma, is there? Um, Julian and our son were recently back in Cairo visiting and um, went to our daughter's grave. Now, here's some insight into, into Arab culture. Mm. Back in when we were there in 1990, this was 91 by the, that time, an Arab, an Egyptian Christian family heard about what happened and that we lost Rachel. Mm. And they said, yeah, we heard about this situation and we would like to offer you a place to bury Rachel in our family tomb, okay. which is how people are buried there. Wow. And so to this day, Rachel is buried in this Christian family's tomb. Wow. That's beautiful. Classic Arab hospitality. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing that. That's, um, gosh, that must've been so, yeah, so difficult at the time. And it wasn't that all that happened in the, in the security of at least your own family around to support you, but you know, you you obviously mentioned that story um, about the Christian family who provided a burial space for your, for your daughter. Did you find other friends, you know, really could empathize with you, or do, do you just built a lot of community through that time? Well, that was one of the times where being on a team showed how important it is to have a team. Yeah, and yeah. our team came around us in an amazing way. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were able to do that, and Julie's parents were there with us. That's Julie true. did have family there. Yeah, that's true. So that was amazing, and um, the team also had someone who was a pastor, and had pastored international churches, had pastored mm -hmm. in the U.S., and so he was there for us also. Mm -hmm. So that was very special. Okay. Wow. So we didn't we didn't walk through that on our own. We, no, yeah, we had others with us around us, and that was yeah, very important. Wow, and I mean, were there times where you you just thought, "Why, Lord, that's unfair. We've given our lives to come and serve you. You know, surely this shouldn't happen to us." I mean, maybe of course that the why questions come whenever we deal with grief or trauma, perhaps. But was there ever an element that, where well, this is not supposed to happen? We're serving you, God. Did that ever? come up or we did it did grief hit you in different ways I asked that why question a lot later um, mm. about other things that happened there was deep grief mm. and and you know when we got pregnant with twins I had thought oh thank you Lord because you're you're making up for lost mm. time is how I mm. how I felt it mm -hmm. but honestly I don't remember asking why right and it may have been Matt, because we did have this, we did, we still had a newborn. We had a beautiful had son. Our son. Yeah. So it was this Feeling strange this mixture of yeah. sorrow and joy at the same time. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, yeah, there's uh, so much we could talk about around that, but let's, let's go forward then a little bit more into just tell us what you were doing as well. You know, you've got all this going on with your family, you've got your team around you. And then how, what was your day to day as well in terms of work? So when we went to the field uh, in 1990, August of 90, you were able to be in Egypt really for years, just mm. on a tourist visa. Mm. Um, we learned eventually that's not the best thing to do for different reasons. Okay. People don't understand how you're a, a young adult at that stage in life out there just being on a tourist visa. Yeah. Um, but that was the case at the time, and we were able to then just focus on language learning for the first two years. Mm. So that was a very strong emphasis of our team. Uh, we needed to get a good capability with Arabic. Um, mm. Certainly two years alone isn't enough. They say it takes 10 years to fluency in Arabic um, for in all the areas of fluency. Mm. But um, yeah, we went to language institute we did other things to use mm. language learning principles in the community yeah so yeah. that's that's really we didn't have another job really for those first couple of years okay yeah that might concern people a little bit thinking 10 years how could i spend 10 years learning language but <laughs> yeah i yeah. suppose it's good to just mention that fluency means lots of different things doesn't it it's easy to you know when someone says to me are you fluent in urdu so well it depends what you mean by fluency because 
after six months of learning, I feel you can get by in the bazaar. You know, you can buy food and and say give all your greetings. After one year, you're more fluent. You you can chat more with people, have basic conversations. After two years, I felt you know full time language. I was pretty fluent actually, and 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 especially in religious language, talking about the Bible, sharing stories. I felt yeah very comfortable in the language. But like you say. If you define fluency as being like a native speaker, gosh, I was miles away, you know, from yeah, that. Right. So yeah. it, it has so many levels, doesn't it? And, and yeah, it, absolutely. It's a great joy. If you can get a couple of years of full time language under your belt, you're usually pretty good to go. Right. We had a good base after a couple of years. And, and we would have kept learning simply by just being there. Yeah. Exactly. And you keep putting, you keep adding your vocabulary as, as your life situation calls for it. Yep. So did it develop into getting an other kind of employment or did you just stay on the tourist visa for many years? So after a couple of years, we took the steps to start to lead our own team. That was, that had been our intention. Mm-hmm. And we had a full team recruited. Um, one family was there on the field with us. Another family was raising funds to, to join us. Mm-hmm. Um but then there was actually a third team in the Cairo area in another part of Cairo that was having, they were there, they were established, but they were having some problems that looked like there was a possibility of that team leader being deported. Mm. So they asked if I, if we would come over and help and kind of take that team over in case that would happen. Well, it ended up that the, that team was doing some very interesting strategies in ministry, reaching out to people that was quite appealing to us. And we wanted to learn from them. Mm. So we ended up actually joining that team. The team leader wasn't deported, but we joined them. And it was at that time when it was the team strategy, we were trying to establish an import and export company. Okay. So that was one of my main roles for a year was to try to help get that company started on behalf of the larger team. Hmm. So I was yeah. focused on that. And just for our listeners to remind us roughly how many people was the population of Egypt and what would be the Christian population too? Cause I know there are Coptic. Christians so there. back yeah, back in the 90s, the population of Egypt was, I think it was 66 million. Something like that. Okay. Population of Cairo was around 12 million at the wow. time. Huge. Mm-hmm. And the, the Coptic Christian population was about 10% of yep. the country. Coptic okay. and evangelical. Right. Both. Yeah. And then what would the, would you guys have been working closely with the Coptic church or evangelical church there? Or, I mean, in Pakistan, there, there's a minority church, but when you know especially when i was first out there have very little interaction with muslims especially in any intentional evangelism yeah. is that similar in cairo at the time in the 90s yeah we really separated ourselves and didn't try to work through the church mm. and that's probably in part because in part because the church there was struggling loving muslims mm. uh, because of the persecution they were under plus yeah it could bring more persecution just by being associated with the types of things we were doing in ministry. Yeah. Um, That, that has really changed now. Mm. And if we were there, we would align ourselves much more closely with the church because they are doing more and um, it would be the the right thing to do is to come alongside them and work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. As I know some friends doing exactly that, which is great. Okay, great. So you're doing some import and export business. You've been in the country at this point, how many years? Four or five years? Or? No, just three years. Just three years. Okay. Yeah. And so, you... yeah, we were, the team was working very closely. We say we weren't working with the larger church, but we were working with a very gifted Egyptian He's from a Muslim background, mm. but he really had the gift of evangelism. Mm-hmm. And he was out there doing some pretty radical things in sharing with people. Mm. Even where we we witnessed one evening, <laughs> what he was witnessing, we observed. 
him start with a couple who had really not heard the message before. And by the end of the evening, this couple, the husband of which was fairly high in the military, mm-hmm. were wanting to follow Christ and even be baptized. Wow. That that all happened within one evening. That's well, we just stood with our, our sat there with them with our mouths dropped open. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And yeah. how, I mean, how did that go? This guy obviously was a natural evangelist. Did he tend to share from his Muslim experience, his background, and did he share from the Quran and so on? Or did he started he... from the he started yeah. from the Quran mm. and was very skillful at then jumping to the Injil to the Gospels. Mm. He yeah. he knew the Quran very well. Yes. And saw the pointers to Jesus yeah. in the Quran and then said, so the Injil says that mm. the Gospels say. Yeah. yeah. So in those days you were working closely with this guy. I mean, were you seeing handfuls of folks come to to know the lord from a muslim background where, where churches there, there were to... there were some people coming to the faith mm. um through him and and through the witness of the team and, and through the witness of the team mm-hmm. so our team leader was also himself very gifted in evangelism and he was a gifted trainer so he was he really focused on training us all in evangelism and getting us out there Mm. sowing seed widely and trying to f- look for people who are open yeah and then as we did that then we would try to kind of have this egyptian brother come alongside mm. these people that we are meeting who we thought might be open and so working with him yeah yeah I saw a number come to face so we had there were two or three very young house churches going mm. for men and at least one there was for one women. one the women had been a part of that and mm-hmm. they asked could we do a separate thing during the day because it's kind of awkward for us to be in this group in the evening with you know without our husbands mm-hmm. and to be out and get home late yeah that just wasn't culturally appropriate so we started mm-hmm. a uh, a daytime gathering once a week for this mm-hmm. handful of women were any of these guys, that, you know, whole families coming to faith or were they, these were individuals who were coming together? It was only individuals at that point. Yep. It was only individuals. And I think we, there are a lot, there's a lot we did not understand. It was also individuals kind of on the fringe of society. Mm-hmm. So we, we didn't understand working with people of influence that at, at the same time then as we were doing this outreach we were trying some creative things we call it contextualization mm-hmm. and what we were doing was trying to take some islamic practices mm. and use them for the sake of the gospel change the we, we took the form and tried to change the meaning okay yeah give us an example of that that sounds interesting so an example was well, some some were very simple things, but things that hadn't been done in Egypt, really. Yeah. So just even the women wearing the Muslim scarves that Muslim women would wear. Okay. To communicate that they were... Respectful. Respectful in following yeah. God. The first time, in our first two years there, I had never worn a scarf. Not even all Egyptian women, not even all Muslim women at that time yeah. were wearing yeah. a scarf. But I went to the other side of the town uh, of the of the city to hang out with women from this team that we eventually joined, mm-hmm. just to see what it was like, because mm-hmm. they were wearing scarves. And on that day, I had more spiritual discussions than I ever had. Wow! In the whole two years previous, mm-hmm. and it was like, well, if that's all it takes for me to be able to enter spiritual discussions, then it's worth making my make my head sweaty and my hair flat (laughs) when I come home at the end of the day if it means people are going to I'll be in that conversation I want to be having Mm. simply because I've got a scarf on my head yes I was all in to at least try that brilliant we use some of the forms of prayer that Muslims would traditionally use yeah lining up shoulder to shoulder facing Mecca facing mecca but saying we were facing mecca to pray for mecca that Mm. the light of christ would 
come there also. Mm. That would be in the little house church that you were connected yeah. with? Yeah, that would be in the house church. And we would do things like take our shoes off as we entered yes. the place where we were going to pray. You know, some definitely some simple things, but it it meant yeah. something. Yeah. We also did a much more radical thing, and we actually changed the Muslim creed. Mm. Well, we okay. didn't say it was the Muslim creed. We, we didn't say, well, <laughs> no, but we did take the Muslim creed, which is... There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. Yeah. That's the basic creed. That's right. That's the Shahada. Shahada. And we changed it to there's no God but God, and Jesus is the word of God. Mm. Cool. So, so that's we, something we, they would do as a ritual, in a sense, in the little house church. They'd use right. some of these little forms of prayer yeah. and yeah, words to say, but change to, to make them biblical and so on that's right mm. and we also did a special we worked with a special translation of the bible mm. it already had been translated it um with muslims in view so it was using some of the terms muslims use mm -hmm. in the new testament which traditionally in the the older bible for mm. uh, traditional christians in the middle east it did not use those terms. It used different terms. Yep. So we use that translation, but then we put in evangelistic footnotes mm -hmm. to really explain some of the things. Yes. Um, For example, son of God. What does that mean? Right. Does it mean, as many Muslims assume, that God had sex with Mary and their son was Jesus, and those that's the Trinity, God married Jesus. Yeah, so often. no, it doesn't, that's not what Son of God means. Mm. Um, and it, I think we used uh, well, th there were some explanations that mm. used pr uh, proverbs that were known mm -hmm. in that culture to make right. it more clear. What, what does this yes. mean, Son of God? Yes, son like I've, he I've heard sometimes, is it is it one of the characters in the early? Muslim years was called Abu Huraira, which means father of cats or something like that. And you can use that or son of the road, you know, to explain this is a right. you know, metaf yeah. metaphorical. It was actually Ibn and Neil, son of the Nile. Right. Is it there you go. is Ibn a Neil. typical yeah. phrase there in Egypt? Yeah. I think is what exactly. we use. Yeah, the that's right. And obviously so, son, of, son of God is more than a metaphor, but you yes. can start there and say, that, you know, it's something that has meaning. Let's explore what this meaning is from scripture and from the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. Right. So as things went on, someone got invited to one of those house churches. We thought this person coming was fairly open, which is why he was invited. Maybe he hadn't really taken the step of faith to call himself a follower of Christ yet, mm -hmm. but he was close. But he brought a friend with him to that meeting, unknowns to us. Mm. And when that friend observed what was happening and observed this, this new creed mm -hmm. and other things, he was quite incensed. Mm -hmm. And we think, it, we think he went to the secret police okay. and told them what was happening. So it wasn't long after that then that the police um, yeah, arrested five of us. Mm -hmm. And the five of us, four of us spent three months in prison. Wow. In Cairo, the fifth was an Egyptian brother. He ended up most of that time in a mental hospital in a very, very difficult situation mm. for over a, over a year. Wow. Tell, I mean, tell us how that went down on that night that that all kicked off. Well, the, so it kicked off the first night by police coming in the middle of the night and raiding homes of two or three of the three, three members. Three and the Egyptian three, brother. Three and the Egyptian brother. Mm. Not and including you guys. Not including us. Because mm. um, we actually hadn't been to that. I hadn't been to that house church meeting mm -hmm. that this guy had attended where these others had. Mm. And this is the days before mobile phones. So people couldn't just call you in the night and say this. Correct. Happened. You, you found That's out the right. next day, did you? That this yeah, we found out the next day this has happened. Um, so once we learned about what happened, we had to, we were holding many copies of this 
Bible that we had had done in Cyprus and smuggled back into the country. This 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 gospel the, course. It was Gospels of Luke. Yeah, yeah Muslim, um, Muslim friendly translation, basically. Muslim friendly right. translation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, the Lord spoke to me that day that the the police were going to come for me that night. It was just I just knew it internally that that was going to happen. I told you, Lita. I said, I mean, and I even went out and bought a magazine and newspapers because I knew I was going to need something to read while I was cooling my heels in some place with the police. And sure enough, that next night they did come at 2.30 in the morning, knock on the door. And it was like, yep, here they are. Wow. And so so had you got rid of all those Bibles at this point? Had you? Well, yes, he, he had. (laughs) <laughs> um, he had taken all of those to the home of some friends on the other side of town, okay. some friends who were totally not related to our organization who, yeah, yeah had, had no particular connection. So they took Brian away that night. They, they came in, they tried to search. Well, they did. They searched our flat, but we had gotten rid of everything. Yeah. We got, we had gotten rid of everything that could have pointed to anybody else. Mm. And they took him away. And I said, where are you taking him? And when will he be back? Yeah. Uh, and their answer was, well, just the police station around the corner, so-and-so. And he'll be back tomorrow morning. And I thought, no, he won't. <laughs> um, and I heard nothing for, I think it was 48 hours. And then I got a call again in the middle of the night. And uh, it was Brian on the phone. I'm like, oh, well, where are you? What's going on? And he said, you know, those, those things that I took to those people's house, Mm. they, if you will get those books, then they say that they will let me go. Uh, They just want, they just want to get those books because they don't like those books. (laughs) And they said, if you don't get them, that they were going to arrest you also. Wow. So yeah, there had been a few that they had found when they had raided the other homes. So that's how they. Yeah. They knew they they existed. They'd heard about them. They'd seen them in their eyes. And it had come out in the interrogation of the others that there were more. So um, I said, okay. And I uh, had a one-year-old at this time and it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm in the house by myself with the one-year-old. So I called some teammates and she stayed with our son Mm -hmm. and he went with me in a taxi. And I don't know, (laughs) I don't know if this is true, but I have always wondered whether the taxi that we got into wasn't driven by an angel Mm. Um, because it was Ramadan. And so people were up in the middle of the night. Lots of people are up in the middle of the night during Ramadan because that's the time when you can eat and you have parties with your friends and your family, you get together with your family. Mm. So it was two or or three in the morning, but the highway was very busy, the highway to go to the other side of town. Mm -hmm. And, um, Normally, a taxi driver will be the fastest driver on the highway in Cairo. Yeah. They, they delight in going faster and winding in and out of lanes, yes. as though there were no such things as lanes. <clears throat> but we got in this taxi, and this driver drove slower than anybody else. Hmm. And that meant that we could see that we were being followed. <laughs> because mm. there was one other car going as slow as we were and they were staying right on right on our tail for 30 minutes as we drove on this highway to the other side of town if you're enjoying this podcast why not give us a five-star rating so that more folks can hear these inspiring stories and join us in praying sending giving and going or how about inviting me or one of my colleagues to speak at your church i'd love to hear from you email me on matt at frontiers.org.uk And now back to the podcast. But we got in this taxi and this driver drove slower than anybody else. Hmm. And that meant that we could see that we were being followed (laughs) because Mm. there was one other car going as slow as we were. And they were staying right on right on our tail for 30 minutes as we drove on this highway to the other side of town. Yeah. So um, I, I was so grateful that we knew we were being followed because we didn't want anybody to see where we were going. And so we managed to change taxis and do some walking and yeah, God intervened and we were able to get these books and bring them back without being, without giving away where 
where they had been stored. Wow. So you, you shook the tail. We shook the tail. <laughs> you got yeah. rid of the, the guy. But only because we knew we had a tail. So yes. that's why I think it was an angel driving the taxi. Wow. <laughs> it eventually became very clear that it was actually went all the way up to the Minister of Interior who oversees the secret police. He learned about us and he was really upset. He was very angry mm. about our approach, the, mm -hmm. the forms that we were trying to use, and very upset with this translation of the Gospel of Luke with the mm. evangelistic footnotes. So they really wanted to get their hands on those mm. so um yeah they held us in the secret police headquarters for the first several days they didn't mistreat us physically they played a lot of mind games with us mm. sleep deprivation and so on which makes interrogations very difficult yeah and, how, uh, how did it look in the in the cell or the place where they were holding you well, we were just in an office at the time but i mean there's mm. There are, at the time, in the secret police headquarters, there were torture floors, and mm. you know we 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 saw the and heard what was going on there, and so yeah. that was quite uh, sobering and yeah scary in a sense. Though, mm. yeah, we were never mistreated physically, but mm -hmm. certainly wondered if we would be, yeah, based on what was happening there, because mm. the, at the same time they were bringing in all these fundamentalists who wanted to see the government overthrown. And so, yeah, there was a huge amount of torture at the time. Mm. Gosh. Yeah, that's scary. Um, so after, in, after those interrogations, then we were eventually transferred to a prison on the outskirts of Cairo. Mm -hmm. And um, we were facing five-year sentences for things like creating strife between Muslims and Christians, which was kind of a weird charge. Mm. Um, proselytizing was a main charge, which mm -hmm. we were trying to see people come to faith. Yeah. Um, I'm forgetting what the other charges were, but yeah. Yeah, we were facing five-year sentences, and I think they fully intended to keep us five years mm. until the Lord used the U.S. government to get us out. Okay, so let me back up to and go back to Jalita. How are you feeling at this point? You've had you've had some communication. You know, he's the first couple of days, at least after two two days, you heard from him. Get these books. Get the books to the police. What what was going on inside you then the, the next few weeks? Well, actually, he he was brought back to our flat to collect the books. Okay. Um, so I got to see him again. Mm. And of course, we uh, we all all the wives were in touch with the embassy, um, with our various embassies to um, mm -hmm. say, you know, what's going on? What are our rights? What's yeah. yeah. But basically, it was a, obviously it was a very scary time. We thought at first the expectation was that they would just be kicked out of the country within a day or so. So mm. we all had our bags packed, so, you know, expecting the word that. Yeah, go to the airport. It's time to leave. Um, however, when they were actually taken to prison, that's when it got really scary. Yeah. Um, but again, we were on a team for a reason. And even though I felt like, uh, you know, why you, you don't want me to come and be with you because I'm marked out. You know, that we, we wives yeah. <laughs> knew that we were exposed and we didn't want to expose the rest of the team, but the rest of the team insisted that's why we are a team. Yeah. We're going to meet together. We're going to support one another. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to pray for the guys. We're going to keep on being a team. Yeah. And I was so grateful for that. So I ended up, my son and I ended up living with another couple. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, because I got kicked out of our flat as well. The oh, landlord yes. kicked us out of our flat. He because, didn't want to have trouble. Yeah, he was scared building. too. Yeah. And as a local, to be honest, if if the police had decided to include him in this and blame him, he's got even less support and help than you guys, maybe. He didn't have an embassy right. on his yeah, side. That's what I mean, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the good news was uh, we, we were able to go in and visit once a week. Each, okay. each prisoner 
could have a visitor once a week and just, just once a week for an hour or two yeah. well it was supposed to only be for 15 minutes wow. in a very crowded room mm. but the warden of the prison showed mercy on us and mm. actually let us meet in his own office oh, wow. and there was one time i was there at least three hours yeah mm. um wow, he so he was a just man and saw mm that yeah. you guys didn't deserve to be he, in his prison. He apologized to us. He said, I know you're not criminals and you shouldn't be here, mm. but my hands are tight. He said, I can't, wow. can't do anything. And every so often we would be called into the prosecutor's office mm. at a court um, to be held over for another 45, 45 day days. period. Okay. Which yeah. they could hold you under emergency law without a trial. And mm -hmm. we were certain after one of those that we would be released and deported. Mm -hmm. He he thought so too. I don't remember why he came to that conclusion, but we had been fasting and praying and we came back from that and the warden broke down in tears mm -hmm. because he found out we weren't being released and we were being held longer and mm -hmm. he felt sorry for us. Yeah. Wow. And you were all at this point being held in, in one cell together, four of you? So the Egyptian brother, after a week or so, his father, who had some influence with the government, mm. had him transferred from prison to a mental hospital, mm. thinking he could get his son out of that situation easier from the mental hospital, which didn't work well. Mm. Um, so it was the four of us Westerners, there were three of us from the U.S., one from New Zealand. Okay. And the four of us were all held in the same cell yeah for that time with with beds and a toilet in the cell or what well, it like it was a i just want to say at this point is another example of arab hospitality at yeah. work he didn't have a bed they didn't have beds it was a bare it was a bare cell cement walls high walls in a prison that built been built by the british <laughs> in the early 1900s um, no toilet, nothing. There was, there was nothing, not a light bulb, nothing, just a locked door and no little window no at the top of window with bars. And yeah, that was it. No windows you could look out of. Yeah. Um, but we we're held in a section of the prison that had a group of about 25 prisoners who had been there for about 20 years already. They had life sentences, which mm -hmm. in that context is 25 years. Mm -hmm. They tried to assassinate the president, President Sadat, before he was actually assassinated. So this is a group of fundamentalists. And mm -hmm. they were always held together in prison. And yeah, these guys looked after us. Even after they found out why we were there, mm -hmm. they're like, and we asked them, you, you know why we're here. And you wouldn't necessarily agree with what we're doing. They said, yeah, but we're, and they took care of us. They gave us their own mattresses. Wow. Four of them gave us a mattress and went without a mattress the full time we were there because we no didn't way. have it. That they was the Muslim, us. that was the Muslim fundamentalist. That was the Muslim prisoners. fundamentalists yes. who were still intent on seeing the government overthrown. Yeah. Um, who took care of us and they made yeah. sure we were fed okay because even the prisoners don't exist on what the prison provides you for food. Yes, you need families to come in, don't you? To usually families bring to come food. in and bring you food, or you can actually purchase some food from prisoners who are running shops mm. in the prison and so on. So they fed us, and they just ensured that we were okay mm. emotionally mm. as you go through these ups and downs in yeah, prison. Yeah, how did you and, talk to them? I mean, good friends you, with them. You could talk while you were in your cell with them, or was this when you were let out for the odd bit of We were let out during the day in a certain area, and we could oftentimes be over in their section, which is right yeah. next to us. It was okay. part of the same kind of cell block. Yeah. And they had things set up a little a little more easy than mm. our cell was. So the, did they ask uh, about your faith? Did did they ask you questions? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely did, and we were able to share with them. And one of, one of them we felt was close to coming to faith. Mm. Uh, our wives were able to smuggle some Bibles into the with the things they bring us in 
on every mm. visit. So we had a few Bibles that we were giving them. Wow. The Gospels of Luke. That's amazing. So yeah, we were able, we were able to share with quite a few of them. One of them yeah. was a doc, one of them was a medical doctor. He really turned against us because he didn't like what we were doing. Mm. But he just kind of kept his distance from us. But the others. Okay. And and mentally, how did you survive those few months with just all the uncertainty and well, the darkness? So there, we all, the four of us, all of us had ups and downs during that time. Yeah. And there's times of, you know, you really can trust the Lord that he's with you and you sense his presence. And there's times where you just throw up your, your hands and you think, wow, the Lord's going to have me here for five years. I don't like mm. this. Yeah. This this sucks. I miss my wife. I miss my children. We were all married. All had young kids. Wow. That was that was the hardest part. Was the separation of our families, along with the unknown. Yep. Along with just losing your freedom. Yeah. Is is a shock. Mm. We had talked about persecution. We thought we were ready for persecution, and we were to some extent. But just going through it. Mm. Um, you don't realize what it's like until it happens mm-hmm. and yeah. you have to deal with that shock. Mm. We, because we're in the cell together, I mean, we every, literally every night we had amazing worship times together. Really? Yeah. It, it was an experience I wouldn't trade for anything. It was, it's an experience I wouldn't ever want to go through again. Yeah. But I wouldn't trade it either because we became, it was a special time with the Lord. Mm. and you really get to understand the fellowship of sharing in his suffering yeah which is quite special yeah and a privilege yeah i've got goosebumps that's yeah i can't imagine what that's like but yeah i mean what a testimony as well to those around you to hear you sing every night you must have yeah you must have been so confused by that <laughs> yeah people would come and ask us about it because we were singing <laughs> boisterously <laughs> yeah. and yeah. uh people I'm glad you them. i'm glad you also said though that it does, those precious moments didn't take away from the, the empty moments we just thought this what is the point where are yeah. we going I, and i miss i don't like this because just because yeah. just because you know the lord doesn't mean you walk through suffering untouched no we we experience the hardships as much yeah, as you experience else. doubt and yeah um i for myself, I came to a place of peace mm. when I understood that it was the Lord who held the keys to mm. every door, like four or five doors that we were locked behind. Mm-hmm. He held those keys. Mm. And when I rested in that truth, mm. then I was I was good. For the rest That's interesting because you mentioned the, the losses you had to deal with, missing your family, missing your kids. And I was thinking also the loss of control is one of the hardest things we as Westerners have to deal with, even on a basic level, moving overseas. We suddenly are not in control. We don't, we don't get it. We don't get the language We we feel like kids and and we're so used to being in control of our lives. That's right. We we think, you know, we think we are, but, and then, but that for you was physically right there in front of you. You, I cannot actually control my life. I can't even see my wife and kids when I want to. Um, and that's an, a hugely vulnerable place to be in. Re- well, you just have to recognize your humanity and therefore God's sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing else you can do. Mm. Wow. Thank you. There were there were things in the New Testament that came alive for us, both those inside and those of us on the team outside came alive for us mm. in new ways. And, and Brian's already touched on the thing that probably was one of the most precious for for the two of us Mm -hmm. was the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings. There's one translation that even used the word um, filling up the sufferings of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Which just, I still don't quite know what that means, but it's Mm -hmm. a precious, precious Mm -hmm. concept. Yeah that we get to share in that with Jesus. And I also remember distinctly sitting beside Brian on the warden's little sofa in his office and saying, no one could, can ever say to us, you don't know, I can't do this because you don't know what it would cost me. 
because now we can say, well, actually, I mean, certainly there are people who have suffered much more than we did, mm. but we can look somebody in the eyes and say, I do know what the cost is. Mm -hmm. I've tasted the cost. Mm. And that's a privilege to be able to say that. Yeah. And then to follow it with, and Jesus is worthy of that cost. Mm. He is so worthy. He's given me so much more mm. than that cost. Yeah. And that's part of the privilege. Right. You got a, a snippet of what Jesus suffered for us. I mean, he not only had the, you know, the imprisonment, you know, he went so much further, didn't he? The, the beatings and the physical yeah. yes. and the losing yes. his and family, yeah. and his friends and the betrayal and the rejection and the, the most horrific torture and death yeah. that right. one could ever imagine um, because yeah. of his love for us. And yeah, you got to sample a little snippet of that. Yeah, um, which which is a privilege. I mean, the verse you mentioned, filling up the sufferings of Christ. I know John Piper loves that and just says, in a sense, that's part of our message to the world that doesn't know Jesus is if I'm willing to to go in towards pain out of love for you guys so you can see something of Jesus. That's in a sense what maybe that verse is meaning that we get to demonstrate his sufferings and his love for the world by just sharing a little bit of that. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for helping us get a picture of that that time for you. I mean, this is decades later, but I'm sure it comes up very fresh as you're talking about it, um, and I'm sure all those emotions come back. Do you have, as you look back, then any any other takeaways? Well, what, I suppose finish the story. What happened? How did you get released eventually? So we were eventually released because of the U.S. government intervening. And it really, that help really came from the Senate and the House of Representatives back in the U.S. We got very little help. In fact, we got the embassy and State Department were unhelpful, mm. worked against us because they learned that we had a strategy of uh, working with the U.S. government back in the States, trying to get aid withheld to Egypt, which is what happened. We, the U.S. Senate and House subcommittees for foreign aid unanimously voted to withhold aid to Egypt hmm. until we are released. Oh. So once they took that position, then we we're out fairly quickly and deported, hmm. put on a plane. And hmm. um, those of us who had been in prison, not allowed back into the country. Hmm. And your New Zealand brother too, at the same time. That's right. Well, no, the New Zealand brother wasn't, he was taken out of prison, came to the airport with us, but then we were put on flights. He was continued to be held. And then they told him the Americans are gone. Mm. We're going to put you in the place where the sun doesn't shine, which was a, a phrase they would use and people would literally disappear. Because New Zealand didn't have um, any embassy mm. in the country, the Egyptian government thought they could do with them as they wanted. But thankfully, mm. the British ambassador was aware of what was happening. They represented the interests of New Zealanders in yeah. Egypt. And they did take some steps on his behalf. And within mm. a few days, he also was deported. Wow. And again, he wasn't able to go back. Either. And are you, are you still in touch with all these guys and the Egyptian brother as well? Um, yeah, we have been in touch over the years. It's a whole another podcast on yeah, yeah, the yeah. the practice story of the Egyptian brother miraculously getting to the states and reconnecting with us. Oh, okay, um, but that did happen amazingly. Mm. And yeah, just an interesting part of this is though we were there on the field in Egypt, the Lord had spoken to me a few months before this whole prison episode came up and showed me that I was out there in Egypt really operating outside my gifts, trying to be a, something other than I was gifted for. And the Lord was showing me my strength is in administration mm -hmm. and that I was supposed to go back to one of our offices and work in that area. Okay. 
So we unfortunately, his wife didn't quite hear the same <laughs> message, um, and we didn't just do it right then. <laughs> yeah, but I think we both realized yeah. God's timing was. Anyway. Yeah, once and it just became clear that once we were deported, very quickly opportunities came up uh, for me to work in that area. There was a need. I was asked to serve. I came alongside our U.S. director and worked with him for seven years as the administrator in the U.S. office, the operations director, essentially. And then when he became the international director, he asked us to come with him to, here to the international office here in the U.K. Okay. And if we've been here 22 years now. Wow. So yeah. I've, I've worked in operations, but then the last 18 years, I've also uh, led the risk and crisis management team mm. so it you know my my time in prison and that whole episode was invaluable and mm. kind of preparing me for that role okay so what would be i mean if some people think um yeah you know these guys are crazy they're gung-ho they're irresponsible governments get annoyed with them at both ends probably our you know our own host government and yeah well, uh, yeah passport country government because we're we're reckless and we're stupid and this is this isn't right. a healthy model of faith um uh, is that how frontiers operates <laughs> are we just wild and stupid and get ourselves into trouble without thinking i mean you're well, no, head of head of the crisis and risk team so how on earth the risk and crisis team. Yeah. and you know it's not uncommon for us to have people deported people held in prison um it happens and it's it's a part of who we are as a mission um yeah. we've dealt with deaths on the field people murdered we've dealt with uh people being kidnapped mm -hmm. we've dealt with imprisonments um so those are things we need to walk with people through with and help them in those times so we try to help prepare them for those times Mm -hmm. And we try to walk alongside with them and work with them when it's happening. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it, it's fantastic what you guys do. I know, you know, some of the work you do in training and supporting those going through crisis, whether it's crisis that absolutely couldn't be avoided, just tragedies that happen, or right. whether this is directly linked to the fact that we're serving Jesus in tough places and tough countries. Yes. But I mean, how would you deal with that charge of, are you guys just being reckless as an organization? I mean, I've never heard anyone particularly say that to us, but I'm sure it crosses people's minds. I'm sure it crosses people's minds. And the thing is, was Jesus reckless to leave heaven mm. and become a, a, a fragile baby right. in the Middle East? Yeah. There's a yeah. book called Reckless Love, isn't there? A book reckless, reckless Love. We should be aiming for reckless love in some ways. Yes. But maybe there's a difference between reckless, self-sacrificing, willing to suffer love and gung-ho stupidity. Is, this a, is there a line that we can draw somewhere? I think we're not trying to recruit people who are eager to be martyrs. Right. Okay. And That's we certainly right. were not eager to be martyrs. Yes. And, and hallelujah, we weren't. You know, <laughs> we weren't facing martyrdom um, in any case. But yeah, yeah. But I think if somebody's going to join Frontiers, mm -hmm. it's prudent to think through the cost. Yeah. And Brian mentioned, I think, um, we'd thought a lot about the cost. We'd thought about suffering. We'd talked about it as a team. Mm -hmm. We had... Um, each one of us weighed that up carefully in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. It's not a thing we took lightly. Yeah. Um, but neither does the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The New Testament addresses suffering. The New Testament was written, a lot of it, by a guy in prison. Yeah. For his faith, for his sharing mm -hmm. his faith with others. Yeah. Um, I think that's where our Christian faith comes from exactly. is a place of taking risks mm. but as i said earlier jesus is worthy of whatever mm. it is that he calls us to we're not looking for those risks we're not 
we're not seeking them and we don't do it for thrill seeking certainly yeah, yeah. um but it is something you need to be prepared for mm, thank you i think that is helpful because you know we we wouldn't have a crisis and relief team it's not just about pastoral care when these things happen there is preparedness there is training we do risk assessments you know we we get all our teams thinking about these things don't we ahead of yes. time and that's biblical jesus said count the cost when you go into battle right. you know a general thinks about what this will cost and what soldiers we need and how to train and prepare them when we build a tower you count the cost before that so it is right. good we're not throwing our brains out at the door here you know we we're seeking god's wisdom but willing to suffer and die for the gospel. That should be hopefully the heart of the believer. We know Jesus is worth everything, even up to our lives. You have to take it to the next step then. We have to be willing for that suffering because we're calling yes. people in the nations yeah. to go through that themselves. Exactly, yeah. That's so right. if we're not willing for it, then it's an empty gospel. Exactly, yeah. Brilliant. No, that's, that's, I'm glad we got to that. Yeah. Thank you. I I want to circle back now to the thing I mentioned earlier, if that's okay. Yeah, please. You asked early on about uh, our involvement with the church in Egypt and Brian said at that time, um, mm. 30 plus years ago, the church in Egypt was feeling quite persecuted but with, with good reason. They were being persecuted mm -hmm. and such is still the case. However, we prayed during that time of going through suffering ourselves mm -hmm. that somehow <laughs> in an extraordinary way, God would use what, what we went through as a testimony to the church in Egypt. And I have heard mm -hmm. from one of our members who is in Egypt now mm -hmm. that she knows that people, she knows people in the church who've said, you remember, and those foreigners went through this. What, what, that's our job. Mm. that's our job we need to be doing mm. what they were doing wow. and that brought tears to my eyes yeah. because that's exactly what we were praying for mm. in those days in addition to lord please just get us out of this mm -hmm. yes lord would yeah. you use this that's would you beautiful and then it comes full circle because i remember was it what how long 10 years ago maybe when those egyptians were captured um by isis yes. was it in somewhere yeah, else yeah. in north africa it was in libya and yeah. they were, you know, brutally killed in front of yes. the eyes of the world on camera. Yes. And wow, what a challenge and inspiration to us in the West to, mm. you know, take our faith seriously. And, and, you know, some of the words and the response of the Egyptian church struck me. And I thought, wow, these guys are just, you know, praising God that they had that courage and that they yeah. stood by their faith while they were, you know, facing that in intense end of their lives. Um, so, and their families talked about forgiveness, yes. which yes. Exactly. 30 years ago, I, I'm not sure we would have seen, but it yeah. showed a real change there. Yeah. And their families talked about forgiveness. So powerful. Mm. Such a powerful yeah. testimony. Exactly. And, and that's beautiful, isn't it? When, when the church in, in the South or the Global East can inspire us, then brilliant. And if we have the opportunity to serve Christ and inspire others around the world, brilliant. It's, it's just a that's what the church is called to do, isn't it? You know, serve the Lord, push out to the peoples that have never heard the gospel and, and somehow try and encourage one another to do the same and, and, and go yeah. further. Wow, brilliant. Guys, this has been fantastic. I, I'm sure we could dig deeper into a lot of this, but I think we will wrap it up there. Thank you for sharing your hearts, your story, um, some of the grief that you guys went through um but this is this is going to be very powerful i'm sure for many of our listeners and you know if anyone wants to get in touch you, they might have questions for you i'm sure you'd be willing wouldn't you wouldn't you they sure. can they can contact you through me just send an email guys to matt at frontiers.org.uk and i'll i'll pass on your questions you know um and and we can get some interaction going if that's something our listeners would like absolutely but, sure. yeah let's keep praying that that faithful believers from China, Latin America, Africa, wherever, and from our country to, you know, UK, USA, will still keep going to the nations and be willing to, to give their lives for the, for the gospel, the best news on the planet. Amen. May it be. All right. Thanks for being with me today, guys. God bless Thanks, you. Man. All right. See you soon. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. I hope today's episode has been inspiring and challenging. For more, check us out on our website 
frontiers.org.uk and on all social media platforms at Frontiers UK. Have a great week and make sure you don't miss our next episode.